Welcome and thank you for tuning in today. This is Book of Mormon Reader and we continue our quest today as we move backwards through the Book of Mormon with um, 3rd Nephi 30. We begin a new book today as we ended 4th Nephi which only took one day. Um, I couldn't believe how fast the time went yesterday because there was so much uh, incredible information and today um, we get to take a little more time because this chapter is really a short one. So let's go again, shall we? The Book of Mormon, 3rd Nephi, chapter 30. Hearken, O ye Gentiles, and hear the words of Jesus Christ, the Son of the living God, which he hath commanded me that I should speak concerning you. For behold, he commandeth me that I should write, saying, Turn, all ye Gentiles, from your wicked ways, and repent of your evil doings, of your lyings and deceivings, and of your whoredoms, and of your secret abominations, and your idolatries, and of your murders, and your priestcrafts, and your envyings, and your strifes, and from all your wickedness and abominations, and come unto me, and be baptized in my name, that ye may receive a remission of your sins, and be filled with the Holy Ghost, that ye may be numbered with my people, who are of the house of Israel. Well, uh, thank you for staying with me. If you'd like to hear my commentary, my thoughts, I did, um, I enjoyed having been a little bit prepared yesterday by having uh, consulted some uh, scholars and also my, my guide that I've been using, Volume 4, Treasures from the Book of Mormon by W. Cleon Skousen. Um, <clears throat> I like to, you know, hear how different people weigh in on things because sometimes even when I'm listening to the gospel scholars, I think, you know, they really missed this point and you know that should that's worth exploring and i you know we all of us are under the constraint of time everybody has equal amount of time and so i mean i get that you know when they're having a um, a formal discussion that's being videotaped and you know they've consulted four gospel scholars who our ancient scripture professors at BYU and they're talking about things and and actually I don't know that anybody's ever done what I'm doing which is just chapter by chapter uh, instead of a chunk of chapters I I know backyard professor on YouTube did something but I did I didn't uh, have the chance to view all of his videos so I'm not sure if he did it chapter by chapter or not so um, it's kind of an, a rare opportunity to be able to just really focus on one chapter per day. I don't know that I've ever done that in my life. And so for me personally, this is, uh, this is a great opportunity. And so if you're following along with me, um, well, wonderful. I mean, seriously, this is wonderful. I don't know how many times this will come. And I also thought about something interesting because it's really tempting to look at what comes ahead because since I'm going backwards I don't have everything you know photographically memorized in my head as to what things are in what chapters and you know I'm just you know I'm plugging along like you are but um, I'm tempted sometimes to look back and this morning in this uh, section I watched on the BYU TV it included verses or chapters 27 through 30 and these guys never actually got to 30 they never even mentioned it they just said oh you know we're out of time and I, of course I can appreciate that so let's look at chapter 30 and <clears throat> look at these different things and when we think about that there's only a, a hundredth that Mormon says that he puts in and yet he included these things that have been listed time and time again so I want to explore these things that he lists with the framework of the Ten Commandments and he gives it also in an, in a <clears throat> this negative way he says turn from it don't do these things but I want to flip it today also and look at the positives of these things so if I was to reread this section here 
And <clears throat> instead of saying what not to do, uh, let's look at what you should do. <laughs> okay, so this is just uh, just something that just came to me at this moment as I'm reading this list of things. Um, so it says, turn all ye Gentiles. So we would flip that around and say, come, you know, come all ye Gentiles from your wicked ways to your righteous ways and repent of your evil doings and embrace your righteous doings of your lyings, of your truth, your honesty, and your deceivings, your transparency, and of your whoredoms, of your fidelities, and your secret abominations. I'm not sure what the opposite of a secret abomination is, but whatever the opposite of secret is, I would say is transparent. Um, abominations would be good deeds, your idolatries. Um, <clears throat> this is an interesting one because if you, you know, you think about what are idolatries, uh, having just taught the Ten Commandments at my niece's baptism, the second one, you know, thou shalt not worship any graven image. Uh, they actually had statues that they worshipped. Um, <clears throat> And we have, I mean, blatant in our day today. They don't even try to hide these things. We have things called American Idol. And people just, you know, oh, they sing so good. I want to be just like them. I want to be like them. Oh, I can't miss it. I can't miss it. And they take something that is a good thing, which is, you know, the ability to sing. And they turn it into something that um, is not pleasing to the Lord. And, uh. So anyway, so, you know, what are idolatries? The, the, the opposite of that would be, you know, not having any, anything that takes you away from keeping the Lord as your focus and of your murders and of your embracing life and your priestcrafts, your priesthood, your envyings, your gener generosity of spirit, your strifes, your rejoicings. And from all your wickedness to all your righteousness and abominations, all your good works, and come unto me and be baptized in my name, that ye may receive a remission of your sins. Okay, when he says when you turn from those things, the blessing is, here it is, ye may have a remission of your sins and be filled with the Holy Ghost, that ye may be numbered with my people who are of the house of Israel. Now, yesterday when we talked about 4th Nephi, we see the result of what happens when people are filled with the Holy Ghost and who are numbered with his people. They became an incredible, incredible, that to the degree that they lived the law of consecration, which in my mind today, I'm not even sure I can imagine what that's like um, because there's always seems to be, you know, somebody with a, a secret agenda, a hidden agenda. Um... Now, let's look at these again here, and <clears throat> let me read it in its entirety without stopping in the positive. Come, all ye Gentiles, to your righteous ways, and embrace your good doings, your good deeds, your honesty, your transparency, and of your fidelity, your, your good works, your loving the Lord, keeping him as your number one and of your embracing life and your priesthood and your generosity of spirit and your rejoicings and all your righteousness and good deeds and come unto me and be baptized in my name that you may receive a remission of your sins and be filled with the Holy Ghost that you may be numbered with my people who are of the house of Israel when you when you look at that and see the fluidity and the blessing that could come from it but isn't it interesting here basically you know in Exodus 20 the Ten Commandments are laid out then they're laid out again when um, in Matthew when they have the Sermon on the Mount they have I think they're laid out there I'm not I'm not positive exactly then they're laid out again when he visits these people and so if I break these down into the commandments, let's look at this. Telling the truth, that's thou shalt not bear false witness. Same thing with deceiving. 
um, your whoredoms, that comes with number seven, which is thou shalt not commit adultery. Um, your secret abominations. Uh, you know, this is the thing that the secret abominations, whatever those are, it has been said again that you can't hide from the Lord, that those things will be shouted from the housetops. And we see today politician after politician, celebrity after celebrity, um, politician after politician, and I don't know what I mean, politician after politician, that, that what they thought would be secret are, are absolutely broadcast for everybody to see. And you see the look on their faces, the shame. And of course, Satan is not there to support those people. They have to, they have to face it. They have to face it. Um, there's no joy in in doing those things that are secret when they're abominations. I mean, there's just nothing. I think if you do anything in secret, it should be doing good deeds for people, um, helping people. You know, washing their car in the middle of the night, mowing their lawn. I heard a beautiful story last night. I I worked a jewelry show, and it was a special group of women because. I knew most of them um, for many years, and in fact, one of them that who told me this story, um, she told me, well, years ago how I first met her, and she was explaining to one of the other guests who was there that she said, oh yeah, I, her husband was one of my seminary students, and she called me uh, one night, and she said, hey, can I come into your class early in the morning, and I want to ask him to the prom. And I said, sure, you know, come either the last 10 minutes or the first 10 minutes, and that would be great. So she came in, and she played um, her own rewritten version of that Adam Sandler song, I Want to Grow Old With You. But she said, I want to go to prom with you. And, of course, he accepted, and, you know, they've, they've come you know, they've married, they have kids. And so looking back, I was telling this other girl, I said, here's an exceptional young man. He, and, and I said, and I'm not even sure you know this. And I was talking to his wife, who was the one who came in my class these years ago. And I said, I offered an incentive to my students that year to go on a sailing trip. And I had one of my mom's friends who uh, was a great sailor and he uh, was a member of this yacht club and I said if all my students who get 100 percent attendance I'll take you you know I'll take you sailing and I remembered when I was in seminary many many even more years ago there was an incentive like that and they and we were taken to Magic Mountain and so I thought, you know, I don't know that anybody does that anymore because you just darn it, you should go to seminary without any external reward. But we were offered one. And so I thought, I'm going to offer one. So I arranged the beginning of the year to have this thing. And I mean, to think of the dedication for a student, you know, I'm not patting myself on the back because I was there 100%, because that was my calling, my job. But the students, for them to come as teenagers before high school, with everything else they're doing, they're tired, they have all these extracurricular activities, to come and be counted and have 100%, it means you're on time, you're never more than 10 minutes late, um, you can be tardy, but you have to be there. Um, that's a remarkable thing to ask high school students to do. And so this was the kid who was one of them that did it. He and his brother both uh, achieved this. Uh, I think it's an incredible accomplishment. And three other students. And so there was one girl and one, two, three, four guys who earned this, that they got 100% attendance. And so I was, um, you know, coming to, we were get loading up to go sailing. And this guy came and with his brother, he dropped off his brother. And I go, what are you doing? You know, aren't you going to come? You, I mean, you've so earned this trip. And he said, um, I, um, I, my mom, uh, she, she was a caterer and he said, she really needs help today. I said, listen, I know she'll understand that, you know, I can't arrange another sailing trip and you've earned this. You can come. And he goes, I know. And he goes, I know, I really, I really wanted to go, but she really needs us. And so he, he didn't go. 
And I told her, I said, listen to the sterling character of a young man before he went on his mission of what he did that he was thinking of somebody else. And she said, well, let me tell you this. She said, when I uh, started dating him, she was dating somebody else too. And she said, every time I would go out on a date, my mom would, I hope she doesn't mind me telling this story. I'm not going to say any names, but she said, my mom would make me uh, pull a bucket of weeds before I would go. And she said, my, that my other guy that I was dating, uh, he said, what are you doing? And she goes, oh, I have to pull a bucket of weeds, you know, before I can go out on a date. And he watched her pull a bucket of weeds before they left. I don't know if it was right before they left or he was just hanging out or whatever the story was, but uh, he watched her. And then um, another time uh, when this other guy who was the guy who was my student, he heard about that and he's like, what's a bucket? Because his mom said, you know, make sure you do a bucket. And he said, what is that? And she goes, oh, you know, she always makes me pull a bucket of weeds before I go out on a date. And so I guess they were going to go out the next day or whatever it was. And she got out of school and she, I guess she must have been a senior because she said she got home around noon. And she saw him loading up um, a lawnmower and leaving. And he was so upset that she caught him because he wanted to be gone before she got there. And come to find out that he had not only pulled a bucket of weeds, he pulled every weed. He mowed the lawn. He edged everything. I'm getting a little of a clip just thinking about it. What an amazing man. And she said, um, and he didn't want her to catch him. And uh, she did. And that was, you know, for the mother, of course, he won her heart by doing such a thing. But I think about for a young man to have the conscious of mind and the selflessness um, to think of somebody else and to not just fulfill a requirement to but to exceed it what does you know what does that do to your spirit to know that you've you've more than accomplished what someone asked you to do when you think of the you know he's thinking like the big picture he says you know she needs help with her yard the mom wants help with the yard and i don't know if she was married or she was a single mother i don't know that part i don't know but she was expressing a need that she had and just happy to get at least a bucket when he knows there's more and he who did that. That's awesome. And I was so, I just was like, see, <laughs> see what a good guy he is. And she goes, yeah, but today, now forget that today, he doesn't do it today. But, you know, it just goes to show you what kind of a person does that? What kind of teaching has he grown up in the house? You know, what were his parents like to do that? I mean, think about that. Was it all of his own initiative or did his parents teach him to work hard and to be mindful of other people and to be selfless? Because believe me, when you do get married, when you do, I mean, you have to think of the other person or you will never make it. Selfishness is the root of the destroying of marriages. And all of these things, lying, deceiving, the secret things, all of these things come down to selfishness, really. I think that's the root of all of these things. And the seed of apostasy is selfishness. Um, <clears throat> excuse me. Now, there's another thing, too, and you watch this today. I don't know what country that you're listening from, but in the United States of America, our uh, current administration is just replete with all of these things they do all these uh things that are not transparent though they promise transparency they they have secret meetings to push through things that we're now having to deal with the consequence of um the dishonesty the deceivings um the are the who was supposed to be our most sterling example our secret service they've been you know sullied with a, a prostitution scandal and all that you know is coming out this whole Benghazi scandal uh, the lyings these murders uh, things that are uh, all of these things each one of these things uh, the priest crafts that's not one of the Ten Commandments except that um, it takes it away from you know thou shalt have the you know only one God envyings that's thou shalt not covet that's number 10 
uh, strives, not sure quite what they mean by strive, but I have a, a, dic a dictionary.com open right now, so let me just quick and look open that. What is strife? Okay, strife. Vigorous or bitter conflict, discord or antagonism. To be at strife, a quarrel, struggle or clash, competition or rivalry. And archaic, it says strenuous effort. A synonym, difference, disagreement, contrariety, opposition. Uh, and this reminds me, years and years ago, I used to uh, babysit. And I remember this kid used to say to his sister, Don't contradict me! I mean, for a little person to say that, don't contradict me. Um, yeah, this okay, guy's so strife, arguing. You know, what is that like when you're around constant bickering? And how, how does that just eat and eat and eat and chip and chip and chip away at your your contentment and your joy in life. Um, I All of these things, each one of these things, they only bring misery. <laughs> all of these things bring misery. And the things that people do, uh, let's see, what are they looking for? Power? Um, Let's see, envyings. I mean, all you do for envying, I think about people who envy other people. You will never, ever be able to fill a void in your heart uh, with things. You just won't. We are, I think we're born with a hole in our heart that only the Lord can fill by us serving and worshiping Him and one way that we can serve him is by serving our fellow man. So when we have these feelings that we, oh, if I only had that house, if I only had that car, if I only had that job, if I only had that, then I would be happy. Happiness is a decision if you don't have any of those things, that you can be happy, you can be content in the most miserable of circumstances. You can be because it's a choice and you can find joy in really horrendous circumstances. Uh, I'm reminded of a story of the people who were pioneers who absolutely suffered one of the worst, worst things. And I think it was the Willie Martin, uh, Martin Handcart Company. And they were bashing uh, how people could do that. And there was a guy in the back who finally couldn't take it anymore. And he stood up and shouted, you know, he said, you were not there. You were not there. And in our, in, in our most trying of times, we felt the Lord with us and we had a Lord's assistance. And I can testify to you that in my own horrible times that I have had, I have been close to the Lord. And sometimes I think, why does it take to have, you know, why does it take a bad, something really bad to have us feel that closeness? with God that we we turn to him and why do we have to be suffering either in mind or in body or in spirit to call upon the name of God to help us we don't <laughs> that's, that's the good news we don't we can have the constant companionship and the peace that we have by doing the good things in life um, and enjoying righteousness enjoying the peace that comes from uh, knowing you know that you're doing the right that you're keeping the laws of the land you're keeping the laws of God and I I'm also reminded of another person who uh, couldn't come into this state because there was a warrant out for his arrest for something that had happened you know 10 or 11 years before and he was fine if he never you know crossed the border of the state but he lived like a fugitive and I mean, recently I've had my own, you know, my car, my tags uh, for a registration. Um, they're actually finally on their way now, but I could not get my car smogged. I had a little check engine light that would come on and I'd go and I paid for my registration, but I had to also be able to pass a smog test. And my car's old. It's like, you know, 2000 um, and now it's 2013. So my Bessie. <laughs> 
poor Bessie. She's plugging along and, you know, one thing after another. And then come to find out we got pulled over and, you know, the tail lights out. And then I guess another time last week, the little light for the um, license plate thing that was out. And I, I know my, my poor husband's driving around in fear that please don't pull me over. Please don't pull me over. Well, we finally have taken care of all those things. And as soon as we receive the tags in the mail, finally got it smogged, all that stuff. Um, you know, can live in peace. How horrible is it to try to have to live with, you know, looking over your shoulder all the time? It's terrible. It's really a terrible feeling. So, um, anyway, I think this is the message here is not just so that, you know, that the man won't bother you, but that your conscious, your light of Christ, the Holy Ghost won't bother you if you do these things. And this is a, a very sobering, um, very, something very sober from Mormon as he, you know, he's interjecting this, even though this is at the end of third Nephi, uh, chapter 30, this is Mormon who is, uh, writing this. In fact, he says, uh, uh, let's see. I'm checking this thing. If I make sure I cover the things that I wanted to cover, um, at this time, it's kind of interesting because this is, we're at the beginning of, um, or, or should I say the end of when Christ came. And this is, a, it says it's 34, 35 AD. And by this time, it says that third Nephi was 67 years old. And I don't know if you've been around people who are in their late 60s, early 70s, or uh, people who are a little bit older than that versus teenagers. But believe me, when you've lived a few years and you've seen a few things, you have a bit of wisdom under your belt and you see things with, um, with the, um, with the advantage of having a scope of time that you've been able to see many, many things in your life where a teenager or a child can only see with this myopic filter what's right in front of them that they can't see even maybe past tomorrow or maybe past next week. And so these are the writings of somebody who has been seasoned with, with sorrow and has been seasoned with grief and seasoned with the vicissitudes of life that surely he has seen murder, all of these things he's seen. Um, one of the things that's, that's not listed in this one um, which I'm not sure what I read it. They usually use this word lasciviousness too. And that's a uh, lewdness and pornography and, uh, viewing and participating and receiving things that are, are unwholesome to your spirit. Um, anyway, this is, uh, there's a lot of stuff in here. And, uh, I just think about the joy that we feel when we serve our fellow man and to have this to be numbered with the people who are of the house of Israel. We've been promised many, many great blessings and the Lord does keep his promises when we do what we're supposed to do. He asks us to be baptized and to have the Holy Ghost with us so that we can make better decisions. And I just want to leave this with you that um, I know that this is a true principle and I have experienced really both sides of you know, the happiness and the misery when you make good choices and when you make bad choices. And believe me, good choices have leave you with a much better feeling. So thank you again for listening. And we will see you tomorrow for 3rd Nephi 29. We're coming up to some of the most wonderful, wonderful parts of the Book of Mormon as we work our way backwards. Thank you so much for joining me and have a wonderful, wonderful day.